I want you to take your Bibles and go with me to the book of Exodus chapter 4. Exodus chapter 4. And outside of Jesus tonight, we're going to do something. We're going to study the life of one of the greatest leaders who has ever lived. That's the life of Moses. Moses is considered the greatest prophet in Israel. And outside of Jesus, I believe he's one of the greatest leaders ever lived. Now, this is supposed to be a little different tonight because this is supposed to be leader to leader. So I'm going to talk to you guys like your pastors are getting ready to be pastors or leaders of churches. And I'm going to share some wisdom and some insight with all of you guys. So for the next few minutes, if I was you, I'd get something to write down because I'm about to dump 32 years worth of experience on you in 30 minutes. And you can learn in life one of two ways, the easy way or the hard way. The easy way is from somebody who's been there, done that, and bought the t-shirt. And you don't have to buy the t-shirt. You can get the t-shirt for free. Or you can go through all the hard knocks and, uh, and then figure out how to get the t-shirt for yourself. But I don't want you to have to do that. All right, let's go to the book of Exodus chapter 4. And tonight, what I want to do for the next few minutes is I want to just talk to you, heart to heart, from one leader to the next. I was called to preach at the age of 12, 1982. Easter Sunday morning, I gave my life to the Lord. First time I ever walked in a church. I was never in a church until that day. I grew up in a family. We didn't grow, go to church. We were, I had great parents, actually. They were better parents than a lot of Christian parents are today. They just believed in hard work and ethics and living right and treating people right. And they taught me to do that. But in 1982, I gave my life to Christ. I knew that I was called to ministry the day I got saved. And there's a whole story around why I know that I was called to ministry the day I got saved. And I'm not going to bore you with those details, but I knew. So all my life, all my life, all I've ever wanted to be is a preacher. All I've ever wanted to do is pastor. I didn't, I didn't want to be a professional football player. I didn't want to be a professional boxer. I didn't want to be a professional businessman. I wanted to be a pastor. I wanted to be in ministry. So I pursued that all of my life. I did. I pursued chasing Jesus and speaking all the way through my teenage years. And so I would preach at different meetings when I was a teenager. I met my wife in high school. She and I made a decision together. We were going to do ministry together. And so... Uh, we chased Jesus through our high school years. Then I went to Bible college to learn professionally how to be a preacher. And then from Bible college, I, in, at 20 years old, the ripe age of 20 years old, I didn't pass gold, didn't collect $200. I went straight to pastoral prison. And uh, for those of you who don't know what pastoral prison is, I didn't get a chance to be a, a children's pastor, a youth pastor, a music pastor. I didn't get a chance to grow into being a senior pastor. I went to a church that had 11 people. They had run off 11 pastors in nine years. And I happened to be the 12th one. They decided they wanted to be their pastor. I went there as a, as a favor to uh, the district leadership that I was serving. They asked me to go there and preach. And I got through preaching, never will forget. Uh, one of the men stood up at the end of my message and said, well, I think we have found our next pastor. And he said, I think we need to take a vote. And so they took a vote that day, and all 11 people voted me in to be the senior pastor of their church. And I've often wondered who was the dumbest amongst us. The 11 people who would choose a 20-year-old out of Bible college to be a senior pastor, or me for choosing to be the senior pastor of 11 people who had just run off 11 pastors in nine years. And so, as you could tell, we were probably a train wreck waiting to happen, and that we were. And so from that point, I started my ministry, and uh, God's been faithful to me. But it hadn't always been easy, and I've learned a lot along the way. And what I want to do tonight is I want to learn you. I want to learn you. That's a, that's a Tennessee hillbilly thing. I want to learn you. Instead of teach you, we say learn you in Tennessee. I want to teach you 12 things that I learned in 32 years about ministry. 12 things. These 12 things are going to help you in what God has called you to do, I can promise you. And you'll get something out of one of these, if not all of these, tonight. I take all of these out of the book of Exodus. Starting in Exodus chapter 4 all the way forward, looking at the life and ministry and leadership of Joshua and Moses 
as they led the people. And so tonight what I want to do is I want to dump these 12 truths on you that I learned. And I hope you would write these down because they'll mean something to you. If not now, they sure will mean something to you later. Let me tell you the first thing that I learned as a leader that you need to get under your belt. Number one, you can't do it alone. The first thing that I learned as a leader is that I couldn't do it alone. It didn't take me long of being a pastor, 11 people, to find myself at the end of my rope, standing at the door every Sunday morning, praying for God to send people to my church. In those days, we had no way of advertising. I didn't have any money, so I had to believe God for everything. I had to literally faith in everybody. And in those days, if a dog or a cat walked on the property, I considered them a visitor. And they counted as four because they had four legs instead of two. And that's how I would believe in my numbers. I know that sounds foolish, but I'm telling you the truth. When a a dog would walk on the property, I would say, well, thank you, Lord. We've got a visitor today. I know that sounds odd, but I was just using all the faith I had. And I learned that no matter how good my preaching was, no matter how great my giftings were, that I could not do it alone. And I think Moses understood that as well. And that's the reason God told Moses, I'm going to send you, but I'm going to be with you in Exodus chapter 4. So the first thing I would tell you as a leader, don't try to do it by yourself. If you're in a position where you can do it, I want you to hear me tonight. If you're in a position where you can do it, the supernatural will never take place. Did you hear what I just said? If you're in a position where your intellect, your talent, your gifting can do it, the supernatural will never take place. But it's when you come to the end of your ability and you don't know what to do, you find out you can't do it alone. It's when God steps in. That in those moments where I'm alone was when I made demands on heaven to step in for me by faith. And there's something I learned. Not only did I need God to do it, I needed others. And I hear people say this all the time, and I want to create, correct your theology. I hear people say all the time, well, I don't need nobody but God. I don't need nobody but God. That's the dumbest thing I've ever heard anybody say. I don't need nobody but God. As long as I got God, that's all. That's so stupid to say that. Do you know why? Because God created Adam and put Adam in the Garden of Eden. And Adam had nobody but God. And God said, not Adam, God said, not Adam, God said, it is not good for this dude to be alone. You can't do life by yourself. You need God and you need others. And it was in those small times that I learned that all 11 of those people out there were a gift to me, just like I was a gift to them. I was the gift of their pastor, but they were the gift to me. They had talents and abilities that I didn't understand that I could use to do all that God called me to do. And let me just tell you something. When God puts you in an impossible situation, the miracle is always in the house. I'm preaching good now. The miracle is always in the house. You don't have to go outside the house. To do anything, everything you need is sitting right there in the house with you to accomplish that miracle. So the first thing I learned in ministry is I couldn't do it alone. The second thing I learned in 32 years is that you need power. You can't just do it alone, but you also need power. Do you know why you need power? Somebody asked me, why do you need power? I am so glad you asked that question tonight. You need power because people follow power. I want you to hear what I just said to you tonight. People follow power. In Exodus chapter 4, when God is going to send uh, Moses into the land to bring the people out of bondage, you know what God did? God had a serpent hit the ground, and, and, or had Moses rather throw his rod to the ground, it became a serpent, and then God told him to take it up by the tail. To pick up that serpent by the tail. Well, I grew up in the mountains of Tennessee. Can I give you some wisdom on something? Never grab a snake by the tail. That's the quickest way for you to get bit and die. You don't grab a snake by the tail. You pin that snake and grab him up by the top of his head so that he can't stick his fangs in you. But God told him to do the impossible or to do something that seemed illogical. Reach down and grab the tail. Do you know what he was teaching Moses? Not only can you not do it alone, but if you're going to do it, you're going to need power that's beyond yourself. Because people are not going to just follow you because you look good. And let me, let me, can, like, oh, I'm about to preach on something now. I feel a, oh, I felt a, I felt a Pentecostal thing come on me right there. Because this is a little pet peeve with me. 
And, and I, I used to tell my staff all the time, and I still tell the leaders around me, if you would worry about having the power of God as much as you worry about what jeans you're going to wear to the pulpit or what Chelsea boots you're going to go pick out from Aldo, if you would worry about the anointing and the power of God more than you worried about how you look and the style you brought to the pulpit, you would accomplish much more with the power of God than you will with your style. Because at the end of the day, they might be impressed with how you dress, but at the end of the day, they'll forget about you unless there is tangible power on your life. I'm preaching good now. We need the power of the Holy Ghost. So it didn't take me long in that little bitty church to realize I need the power of God. Listen, there has to be power in your life. There has to be power in your life as a leader. You have to have power to live an overcoming life. You can't even be an overcomer without power. you got to have power to live an overcoming life. There has to be power because power causes demonstration. And demonstration in ministry is important. Somebody has got to demonstrate the power of God to show everybody else who's God and who's not. Right? That's one of the things I love about Elijah. Elijah has no problem with that. Elijah's like, okay, do your little deal, do your little dance, do your little uh, celebration, and, and let's see if you can call down fire. And then at the end of the day, what does Elijah do? Elijah says, dump water on it. I tell you what, do everything you can do to kill the move of God in my church service. Make it as hard as possible for God to move. And at the end of the day, what happened? Fire fell from heaven. You know why? Because Elijah knew how to access the power of God. You need power for demonstration. And I cannot tell you how much demonstration of the power of God will do for your ministry and for your growth. Because it was times when I couldn't get anything to grow in my church that God healed a blind man and we went from a hundred people to a thousand people overnight. Not because I was a good preacher, but because God healed a blind man in front of a hundred people that didn't, wasn't even sure that He could do it. Listen, when God shows up, you don't need Instagram and Facebook and YouTube. When God shows up, the anointing of the Holy Ghost to do all the advertisement you need. Preach on, Pastor Shane. I think I will. Y'all don't have to worry about amen. Me. I amen myself. I get happy in my own preaching, right? Number three, third thing I learned in 32 years of preaching, I learned that your life has to be holy. Your life has to be holy. You know, when you study the life of Moses, one of the things you learn about Moses is Moses thought that God would exempt him because of problems in his home. He thought that God would exempt him because of problems in his home. But what he had to learn is that if you can't live holy, listen to what I'm about to tell you. Listen to what I'm about to tell you. If you can't live holy, God will oppose you in the way. Moses, if you can't cut the foreskin off, God will oppose you in the way. And I want to tell you, leader, listen to me. If you can't live holy, God will oppose you in the way. Holiness matters to God. And others won't understand your consecration. Others won't understand you saying, well, I don't drink. I don't smoke. I don't go to certain places. They won't understand it. But let me tell you what I know about God. God honors holiness and God honors consecration. So number one, I, I learned that I could not do it alone. Number two, I learned that I needed power and I learned real quickly that my life had to be different than everybody else. I don't care what the world is doing. I want you to hear me today. You as a leader are operating at a higher standard than everybody else. Do you know the Bible says you're going to be judged more harshly than everybody else? You're going to stand in double judgment. Everybody say double judgment. Come on, say double judge. What that means is you're going to give an account for your life and you're going to give an account for everybody else's life that you impacted. You're going to get double judgment. So you better live right. You know how, hol how, much, how, holiness, how much holiness was important to, to the Apostle Paul? The Apostle Paul, the man who wrote two-thirds of the New Testament... The Apostle Paul, the man who was caught up into the third heaven, the Apostle Paul that got all these great revelations and mysteries from God, the Apostle Paul said he feared the day he would stand before God. That's how my holiness, how much holiness should be important to you. Think about that. I learned that I had to live a holy life. Number four, the fourth thing that I learned in 32 years is that there must be obedience based upon relationship. Not obedience based on obligation. I need obedience based 
on relationship. Do you know why I need obedience based on relationship? Because when I had obedience based on relationship, I got courage. I had courage when I was obeying God based on the relational terms. Not just because of what He said, but because of, of God and our relationship. Whenever I obeyed God out of relationship, it gave me courage. And let me tell you what courage does. Courage helps others to follow you when you're following God. So you need obedience. And let me just say this about obedience. It needs to be quick. It needs to be quick. So if the Lord corrects you on something, you do it quickly. You obey quickly. You don't wrestle with it a long time. Quick obedience brings the blessing. Obedience is better than sacrifice. And so one of the things I learned in ministry is that the window of blessing was on the other side of my obedience. And so a lot of times I would be wrestling with God for something and all I had to do was just obey what He told me to do and all of a sudden here would come the blessing. But I would wrestle for a long time because I didn't want to do it a certain way or it was contrary to my logical mind, my, my thinking. And so I would try to go a different route. But as soon as I would quickly obey, the blessing of the Lord would come on the heels of it. Obedience based on relationship is important as a leader. The fifth thing that I learned as a leader. Y'all okay? Well, all two of you. I said, are y'all okay? I'm trying to give you 32 years worth of experience right here in 30 minutes. The fifth thing I learned about uh, following Jesus is this, that there is always a journey involved. There is always a journey involved. If you think that God's going to beam you up, Scotty, like Star Trek. That, look here. Don't, don't you love how God does? Here's how God does. I'm going to give you an example. How God, here's how God does. <laughs> this makes me so mad about God sometimes. Can I just be honest, transparent? This is how God does. Get thee up and get thee out. And I'm going to bring you into a land. Get thee up and get thee out, comma, and I'm going to bring you into a land. Well, you might as well take that comma and that and and stretch it out 50 years. God doesn't tell you that, does He? He doesn't tell you that the comma and the and last 25 years. He doesn't tell you that the comma and the and meant that you were going to maybe lose your wife to Pharaoh in Egypt. He doesn't tell you that the comma and the and meant you might have to take your son up on top of the mountain and sacrifice your son. He doesn't tell you all of that. Does he? he just he makes it sound so easy, right? I tell God sometimes, you bait and switch me. You bait and switch me. Get thee up and get thee out and I'm going to bring you into the land. And we get in, a, in, in church and we get on an organ and say, Whoop, glory to God, I'm coming into the promise. And we, we feel like God's going to beam us up like Scotty and just set us down into the promise of God. That's not how it works. Here's what God means when He says, get thee up and get thee out. Start your journey. That's what He means. And if you'll walk this journey, I will bring you into the land that I have promised you. There is always a journey with God. Let me tell you some important things about this journey. Number one, it'll take, us, take you places you've never been. Whenever you get on a journey with God, it will always take you places you've never been. Which means you can never get comfortable. In 32 years, I've always been uncomfortable. Do you know it's a sin to get at ease in Zion? Lord, help me, Jesus. This is a hard crowd to preach to. It is a sin to get at ease in Zion. Let me just say it like this. Do you know the last giant before the promised land, the last giant the children of Israel had to destroy before the promised land was Og? I'm going to give you some of you preachers preaching Stuff right now. Og. Do you know there's nothing in the Bible about Og? No victories he won. No cities he destroyed. No great military adventures. Do you know there's only one thing the Bible tells you about Og? That he had a king-sized bed. The last giant before entering the promised land was a king-sized bed. Some of y'all should have got that revelation right there. So let me tell you what happens. Right before you enter your promised land, you're always tempted to get comfortable. 
And here's what I've learned about God. Whenever, whenever I'm tempted to be comfortable, God's trying to bring me into the greatest promise of my life. I don't need to stop then. So I just got to keep pressing in to the promise of God. So your journey will take you places you've never been and you can never get comfortable. All right. Number six, the sixth thing I learned in 32 years is there will be times of discouragement and disappointment. The journey's never easy. There will be times when there will be discouragement and disappointment. Moses had those times. If you want to read about one, go to Exodus chapter 14, verses 11 through 14. Moses is really finding, running into some discouragement. The people come to him, and here's what they say. You mean to tell us that all you did was bring us out here into the wilderness to let us die? There were graves back in Egypt. We could have died in Egypt. You mean to tell it? And all of a sudden, discouragement just overwhelms Moses' life. I want you to hear me today. In 32 years, I've had more moments of discouragement than I can even count or recount to you. More disappointments in people than I could ever write in a hundred books. I could tell you stories about how my best friends have betrayed me. I can tell you stories about people I've poured into all my life have betrayed me and walked out on me. Discouragement and disappointment. And I can tell you thousands of stories about all the times that God would give me a vision to do something and people around me would tell me, you're never going to be able to do that. You're never going to be able, you're not smart enough. You're not gifted enough to be able to do that. And every single time it was a lie. So let me tell you some things that you need to write down under discouragement and disappointment. When ministry grows, there will always be a Red Sea. Write that down. When ministry grows, there will always be a Red Sea. You know what that is? A Red Sea is a chance to go backwards. So let me tell you something. Every time ministry grows in your life, the devil will make sure you come to a Red Sea and give you a chance to go back to the thing that God brought you out of. I am teaching you some good stuff right now. There's always a chance to go back. Hear me well tonight. As a leader, you have to know the moment of leadership. You have got to be intuitive and discerning in the moments that you're in as a leader. And I want you to hear me tonight with this thought. When things are y'all ready? If it's and drop a big one on you. When things are birthed, when things are birthed, there is always a 70 5% chance that something bad will happen. I'm giving you the statistics. Basic business statistics. When you birth something new, there's always a 75% chance something bad is going to happen. Let me explain it like this. When a woman gets pregnant and she's about to give birth, you've got some options. The baby could die. The baby and the mother could die. The mother could die. Or both the baby and the mother could live. There's a 75% chance that something bad is going to happen. And watch this. When you're in the middle of something and discouragement comes, you know what discouragement does? Discouragement points out the 75% chance of everything that could happen bad in your decision or your ministry. And you've got to learn to change your perspective and not look at what could happen bad, but start looking at what could happen God. Amen. Right? Yeah. And it's hard to operate in that, but every great leader I know operates in that dimension. There are always three types of leaders. Three types of leaders. There's an Aaron. You know what Aaron's do? They pass the blame. It's never their fault. It was these stupid people, Moses, that you left me to watch after. And then there's a Moses. A Moses can love you, but can't sanctify you. He'll love you, but he can't cut that foreskin off of your life. But then there's the Joshua's that come along. You know why Joshua got to possess the land and nobody else didn't? Because Joshua is the person who would deal with flesh. So whenever you come to those moments in your life of leadership, when you're discouraged, you've got to decide what kind of leader you're going to be and you've got to rise up and do what God has called you to do. Let me give you the seventh thing that God taught me in 32 years. People you lead will never make it unless you lead because you love them. 
Mic drop. <laughs> the people you lead will never make it unless you lead them because you love them. That's something I learned as a pastor. And what that means is you got to love them more than you love yourself. And sometimes that's really hard to do. And what that means is you got to decide whether you're going to be a hireling or a shepherd. A hireling is a person who works for money. A shepherd is somebody who leads because they love people. And you're going to be one of the two. You're going to be one of the two. You're either going to be a hireling or you're going to be a shepherd. Let me teach you something I learned about loving people. Love will keep you from running. Love will keep you from running when all hell breaks out. You'll want to leave. But in your mind, you'll be like, I can't leave because I love these people. What's going to happen to these people? That's what real love leadership does. Love will keep you interceding. It'll keep you praying. Love will keep you humble. When God wanted to wipe Israel out, Moses loved the children of Israel so much, he come to God and said, God, if you're going to wipe them out, wipe me out too with them. I don't, I'm not even going to... You just wipe me out with them. What caused him to be like that? Love. Love would cause him to humble himself. And he had a, Just think about it. Moses had an incredible opportunity. God said, I'll wipe them out. And I'll make a whole other nation and give them your name. You know what most modern church leaders would have done? Kill them all, God. Kill them all, God. And we're going to start a denomination. And it's going to be Shane Warren Ministries International. And it's going to, we're going to go around. We just wipe them out. Not Moses. Moses humbled himself and said, No, God, I tell you what, if you wipe them out, wipe me out too. That's love, folks. That's love. And one of the things I learned is you got to love people and you got to lead. They have to know that you're leading them because you. Help me, God. Just because you got pastor on your door doesn't make you a leader no more than going to McDonald's makes you a Happy Meal. And this is what we've done in the body of Christ. Where everybody got to be an apostle or a prophet or evangelist, pastor. Those aren't titles. They're functions. They're functions. God's not interested in your title. He's interested in your function. I want to teach you much more, but y'all ain't pulling very much, so I'm just going to keep on going. Number eight, the eighth thing that I want to give you tonight. The destination will get you through the desert. You better write that one down. If you don't write nothing down, you ought to write that one down. I learned in 32 years that the destination would get me through the desert. Let me tell you what that means. Your vision will drive you when times get real dry. Destination. Can I give you something that's going to bless you tonight? All right, I got two of you. Can I give you something that's going to bless you tonight? Listen to me. Desire is proof the destination exists. You better get that. Desire is proof the destination exists. If you have a desire to do something, it is proof. Listen, when I was in Louisiana pastoring, an interesting thing happened. Y'all, how many ever heard of Duck Dynasty? Y'all have seen Duck Dynasty? I lived in West Monroe, home of Duck Dynasty. Hunted with those guys. And there was this interesting phenomena that took place every year about the same time. Somewhere around September to October, it would start getting cold up north. Canada. And that cold air would cause a duck that was born up there that year. I mean, the duck was just born that year, just a little thing, right? He ain't never been nowhere in his life. He had been in one pond, maybe two in Canada. Fly from pond to pond, creek to creek. He ain't never been nowhere in his life. And all of a sudden, around September, cold snap would come in, and inside of that duck's heart, Something would rise up and say, fly south. Go to Louisiana. Well, he's never been to Louisiana. Not that I know of. They don't have maps. I've never seen a, a duck carrying around an iPhone with a GPS on top of it. I've never seen that. 
But something in his heart would tell him, go south. There's better land down south. There's better water down south. And did you know something would happen? That duck would do the craziest thing. It'd get cold enough, get uncomfortable enough where he was that all of a sudden he would finally mount up with wings and he would start flying south. Now the whole time, he's been shot at by duck hunters. From Canada down to Louisiana, he's being sh- every pond he lights in, he's being shot at. But yet something tells him, Just keep on flying even though you're getting shot at. And then somewhere about December in Louisiana, guess what would happen? I would be standing under a cypress tree with a shotgun with ducks spread out and that duck would fly right into my bullet. And I would eat that duck that night. If you've never eaten duck, you missed out. I'd eat that duck. What I'm trying to teach you, watch. The desire in the duck's heart was proof the destination was already there. Let me teach you something about vision. When you get a a real vision from God, the desire is proof the destination is there, whether you can see it or not, or whether you've never been to it or not. And I'm giving you a secret in my ministry right now. You know how I've accomplished some of the things I've accomplished in my heart? Not because if I listened to people, I wouldn't have done anything for God. But what happened was in prayer sometime, I was praying in the Holy Ghost, and God would give me a vision and a desire in my heart. And, and unlike some of you that would just sit here and say, well, I'm going to wait on it to come on me. If God wants to do I would say, no, I'm going to start mounting up with wings of eagles and I'm going to fly toward the destination. Desire is proof that the destination exists. <sighs> Help me, Jesus. I'm trying to figure out how much I want to give to you. Okay, sure you do. I hear you. Let me tell you something I learned about destination. The people must know destination to deal with the difficulties of the desert. I couldn't just tell them about the desire and the destination that was in my heart. As a leader, I had to make that desire so real to everybody else under the sound of my voice that 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 desire or destination would get them through the desert they had to walk through. I'm done. All right, number nine. Number nine. I'm going to go. I'm going to keep going. I'm keep going, y'all. You want more, you pull on me. I'll give you more, but I'm not going to give it to you if you don't want. I'm not here to spoon feed you. You're right. Number nine. Very, oh, whew, I don't even know if I should give you this one. No, I'm serious. I don't know that you can handle this one. Some of y'all are too. You, you think you can handle it? Okay, we'll see. Number nine. I learned that very few people who start the journey with you will finish it with you. Very few people who start the journey with with you will finish it with you. Listen to this. Moses brought millions of people out of Egypt. They started the journey with him. And the great majority of them died in the desert. Remember me talking to you about how the destination helps them get through the desert and all that stuff? Not everybody. Not everybody's going to make it to the promised land with you. In fact, I just want my son to hear this because right now we're in the middle of a church plant and he's not walked through this before, but he's getting ready to see it. He's going to find out that the great majority of the people who are sitting in my congregation now, the 300 that call our church home, brand new church plant, he's going to find out That when we finally get to the destination God wants us, we might look up and there might be one or two out of 300. You say, well, that means you're a failure. Well, then Moses was a failure. The apostles were failures. Jesus was a failure as a leader. But I'm telling you, there's going to be a lot of people people that will not make it. And so, if... now. If that's the case, hear me. I'm going to give you a little nugget here. If that's the case, your leadership can't be based on popularity. That's good stuff there. If that's the case, the majority of the people aren't going to make it to the promised land with you, then your leadership better not be based on popularity. It's got to be based on principle. Right? I got to move on. Number 10. Here's the tenth one. I was going to give you more, but you couldn't take it. I told you you couldn't take it. Number ten. Here's the tenth 
thing I learned in ministry. Your leadership must be based on listening and lordship. Listening and lordship. Listening and lordship. Now let me tell you why I say that. Because your listening determines direction. But lordship helps you remember who's in charge. Listening and lordship. Listening determines direction. Lordship helps you to remember who is in charge. You say, I don't get what you're saying by that. Do you know why you don't get what I'm saying? Because you've never been there at that moment where you've led something really big where God told you to do something and you got the direction. And then all of a sudden, God starts blessing you because you obey. And like many preachers, you forget who's really in charge. It goes to your head. You start believing your own press. I've been there, done that, bought that t-shirt and messed up royally. And I'm telling you, it'll happen. Your leadership has to be based on listening and lordship. God always has a plan for us. Listen, God always has a plan for us. Say that out loud. God always has. Say God always has a plan for us. No, the people watching around the country, they didn't say it. So we're going to do it again. Come on. God always has a plan for us. But you're dispensable. God does have a plan for us. But if you get arrogant to the point you think that God needs you to fulfill his plan, God will move you out of the way and raise up another one who looked just like you. I used to tell my son all the time, son, you don't know me. You keep messing with me, I will kill you. Me and your mama get together and we'll make another one that looks just like you. I won't even miss you. I won't even miss you. And here's what I found about a lot of Christian leaders. They think they're indispensable. A lot of Christian leaders think they're indispensable. They think they're God's gift to heaven and humanity. But that's not the case. Okay, let me give you number 11. It gets better. The last two get better. <laughs> See, he said, praise God. He's like, it's a heavy, okay. All right, number 11, 11 thing. I, I only got two more and I'm done. Y'all are the ones who wanted this leader to leader stuff, okay? The way to the promise is never as sweet as the walk with God. Selah. The way to the promise is never as sweet as the walk with God. Let me say it another way. The destination isn't nearly as great as the journey. How many has ever bought a steak based on the sizzle? You ever bought a steak based? Some of you are like, what's that mean? How many of you have ever in your mind, you have eaten a good steak somewhere? And I mean, it's good. You've eaten one, bro, I'm telling you. I love good steak. Like a Ruth Chris steak. Shalabakata. I felt anointing on that one. A Ruth Chris steak, right? And I mean, it was good. That little garlic butter and that sizzle on the... uh, Hey, glory be to God. Come on, we ought to get some Pentecostal hucking bucks on that, right? So, you ever ever had... And have you ever been months down the road and all of a sudden be driving in the car and out of the blue, you get this taste for that steak? You're like, oh, I'm going to go get that steak. And so you call Ruth Chris and you make an appointment and you're like, oh, I'm going to go get that steak. And that steak's going to be so good. And then you finally get the steak and it's not cooked. The same cook didn't cook it, so it's not as good. You bought the steak based on the sizzle. My daddy used to be a car dealer. Later, as I grew older, and my daddy used to tell me, son, you got to learn how to sell the sizzle on the steak. He used to tell me that all the time. You got to learn how to sell the sizzle on the steak because the steak is never as good as the sizzle. Used to t- Some of y'all have any idea. This is street talk, okay? The steak is never as good as the sizzle. Here's what I'm trying to tell you. That destination you want, like for me, I'm going to build a church. Two or three thousand people. I can remember when I was just 11 people. I'm going to build a church of 500. Everybody thought I was crazy. We got to 500. 
I'm like, this ain't near as good as I thought it was going to be. And I said, well, I tell you what, if I could build a church of a thousand, I will have accomplished my vision. I'm going to build a church of a thousand. And then I finally got to a thousand. And when we got to a thousand, I'm like, what's the big deal about a thousand people? That's no big deal. It's like a thousand more problems, right? right. I got a thousand idiots running around right now, right? I used to tell people all the time, take your drama to your mama. Don't bring it up here to church. It it was like like a daycare with a thousand kids. I said, well, you know how to break that. I'll just go to 1,500. When I get to 1,500, we'll break that. I tell you, I got to 1,500. It wasn't as good. You know what God taught me? Listen, the way is never as sweet as the walk with God. Looking back on all of my accomplishments, the things that I enjoy now is all the little things I did along the way. The times that God would, I knew God's presence would come or we'd need a miracle and I'd have to trust the Lord and God would just, it wasn't when I got to the destination it was so good. In fact, I got to the destination, I'm like, oh, that steak is not all that great. Right? So now, I don't chase the destination. Now I try to say, I'm going to enjoy the journey with God. Right? Some of y'all, you're like, yeah, amen. And then you're going to get 50 years old like me and say, boy, that preacher was telling the truth and I just didn't listen to him. I said, amen. Didn't even know what I was saying. (laughs) Amen to him. All right. So let me just add a couple of points here. When you're on this journey with God, you must be consumed with Christ or you will be consumed by the desert. When you're on this journey with God, you got to be consumed with Christ or you will be consumed by the desert. Listen well. The task will wear you out if it gets in the way of your walk. The task will wear you out if it gets in the way of your walk. The task will wear you out if it gets in the way. Of your walk. Ooh, that's so good right there. Y'all should give me an offering right now. Let me, but I know you're college students. You ain't got nothing. All right, let's go to number 12. Let's go to number 12. That's exactly. Let's go to number 12. This is the last thing I want to give you tonight that I've learned in 32 years. When your time is done, when your time is done, make sure that you did all that you could. When your time is done, make sure that you did all you could. Paul said, my life has been poured out for you like a drink offering. Listen to me. Here's my mantra, my motto. Live full, die empty. Live full, die empty. Say that out loud. Live full, die empty. I didn't say live empty. I said live full, die empty. Whenever my time comes, I want people to stand wherever they stand, whether it's at a graveside, and say he gave everything he had for the kingdom of Almighty God. Live full, die empty. Moses brought them as far as God would let him. Moses brought them as far as God would let him. Listen to me. One of the hardest things for a leader to discern is when they're done. Because we take ownership of the vision so much that it is so hard for us to discern when our moment is over. God let Moses lead them as far as he wanted him to take them and he was done. And I heard people misquote this. And if you've ever heard this misquoted, you correct them. They say, well, Moses never got to enter the promised land. That's not true. Read your Bible. Go look at where the boundaries of the promised land is. Moses was inside the promised land. What Moses did not get to do was take full possession of the promise. But God allowed Moses to lead them as far as he would let him. Here's the last point I want to give you. Moses eventually got to step into the promise Because he was obedient in the midst of disappointment. 
Moses got to step into the promise because he was obedient in the midst of disappointment. Moses got to step into the promise because he was obedient in the midst of disappointment. I just want you to know today, whenever you get through at the end of your journey, you better be able to stand before God and say, I did all I could do. I gave 110% of my abilities, my talents, my time, everything I had to God did the best that I could do. Now, even your best is going to be a filthy rag to God. But don't stand before God and hear these words. You didn't do very well. That's, that's not going to be a good day for you. You want to hear, well done, good and faithful servant, enter into the joy of the Lord. I want to hear that. I know that I've, listen, in 32 years I've missed it a lot. I've missed it a lot. I've messed up a lot in 32 years. I've blown it a lot in 32 years. So whenever I stand before God, I'm going to have to give an account for those things as a leader. I really believe that. I'm praying I find mercy. I'm praying I find mercy. But when I stand before God, I don't want God to say, I set this open door before you, but you didn't take advantage of it. I called you to do something, but you didn't step into it. I put a desire in your heart and you never made a move. I don't want him to ever be able to say that. I want, if anything, I want him to be able to say, you know what, you messed that up because you're trying too hard. Right? When you stand before God, say that you did all you could. Live full, die empty. Say it. Live full, die empty. Come on. Live full, die empty. One more time. Live full, die empty. I want to pray over you. And she's getting ready to come right now. Father, I thank you for all of these leaders here in California and also all across America, around the world, even those who are here observing campus days, trying to make a decision what college they're going to go to, where they're going to plug in, where they're going to study. I pray by the leadership of the Holy Spirit that they would make SUM their college of choice because they're hearing today what real leadership is all about. I pray, Father, in the name of Jesus over every leader under the sound of my voice that, God, you would keep them, that you would protect them, that you would make your face to shine upon them, that you would grant grace and mercy to them, that you would give them kingdom peace, that you would put your name on them, Lord that You would bless them coming in and bless them going out, that You would cause them to rise up as leaders, be the head and not the tail, to rise above and never be beneath. I pray, Lord, in the name of Jesus, everything their hand touches as a leader would be blessed. For we're living in critical times right now, this moment, when there is a crisis of leadership in the land. And I believe that SUM is raising up the next generation of leaders to reap a billion soul harvest for the King of kings and the Lord of lords before Jesus descends out of heaven with a great shout, the voice of the archangel and the trump of God and calls us home. Father, I pray, make SUM and these leaders a mighty instrument of harvest for Your name's sake. In Jesus' name, Amen and Amen.